Tonight, Russia widening its attack on Ukraine, striking a city seen as a safe haven in the West and intensifying its barrage on the capital. Apartments in Kyiv destroyed by Russian missiles, walls and roofs sheared off, a kindergarten building in ruins and a bombing near the Lviv airport. The blast shaking a city where many are sheltering. Civilians coming under attack in Mariupol. 130 people pulled from a bombed out theater where women and children were huddled. Hundreds still trapped in the wreckage days after the attack. Plus, President Biden's high stakes call with President Xi, his warning if China comes to Russia's aid. Desperate to escape, dozens of African nationals trapped in a region under Russian control. Video showing border agents kicking and beating students as they try to leave Ukraine. Children and a pregnant woman among the stranded. The efforts underway to help black Ukrainians get to safety. Back at home, news on the pandemic. Moderna requesting authorization for a second booster shot for all adults. The appeal broader than Pfizer's request for a fourth dose for people over 65. But do public health experts agree another shot is needed? Dangerous storm threat, powerful winds ripping through Alabama, destroying homes and bringing down power lines. 11 million people under a severe weather alert from Georgia to Ohio. We'll have the track. Cashing in the surprising pay gap in college basketball. Women earning more than the men, signing endorsement deals with major brands. The new rule allowing athletes to score big. And your guide for what to binge watch this weekend, from a documentary about an infamous bad vegan to new movies from Hollywood stars Ben Affleck and Brian Reynolds. We've got a pick for everyone on this Friday night. Top Story starts right now. Good Friday evening to you. I'm Vicki Wynn in for Tom Yamas. We begin top story tonight with the war in Ukraine. Civilians under attack across the country. Smoke billowing from an aircraft repair facility near the Lviv airport after it was hit by a Russian airstrike. That city, a refuge for hundreds of thousands fleeing violence in the east and south. It's now a target too. Empty strollers, 109 of them lined up in Lviv city square. They represent the children killed in this conflict. That number likely growing as Russia continues to fire on civilian safe havens. Residents in Kyiv again woken up by the sound of explosions all around them. This apartment complex hit by dawn, a nearby school destroyed. As the war rages on, President Biden today meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping. The call lasting nearly two hours. Biden telling Xi there would be, quote, implications and consequences if China provides support to Russia. The warning coming after U.S. officials accused Russia of seeking military aid from China, something both countries denied. But as the likelihood of a diplomatic solution to this conflict remains uncertain, the devastation on the ground in Ukraine is growing. Richard Engel leads us off again from Kyiv tonight with an up-close look at the toll this war is taking. With its military advance stalled, it seems that Russia is increasingly targeting civilians. A missile exploded here in Kyiv around 8 a.m. this morning. No military targets anywhere in sight, just apartments, a kindergarten, an elementary school, and a grocery. An entire community devastated in a split second. Attacking apartment complexes like this is a terror campaign to frighten Ukrainians into surrendering. But it's not working. And all the damage here and across this country is only convincing Ukrainians of the need to fight even harder or lose everything. In front of her building, Natalia was having a first cup of coffee when suddenly her window exploded into shards. Everything started crumbling. I felt the shockwave and I fell on the floor, she says. But even covered in iodine for all the cuts, she's optimistic. Our wonderful boys and girls are fighting and we will win. Our enemies, those damned occupiers, say we have some Nazism here. I don't understand what's happening in those brains of theirs. This is my mother, this is my father. Nearby, Eugenia was salvaging what she could from her apartment, especially photos. Eugenia visited a neighbor who was grateful to be checked in on. 
It's okay, Eugenia tells her. Just promise me on our victory night, you'll drink champagne with me. But in Russia, Vladimir Putin is determined for that toast to never happen. In a mass stadium rally today, bristling with Russian flags, he praised the troops on the anniversary of the annexation of Crimea from Ukraine eight years ago and said this war is going to plan. As Russia attacked new locations today, including an aircraft repair facility outside Lviv near the Polish border. Lviv has been a relative safe haven, a transit point for millions of exiting refugees. Activists in the city lined up 109 empty strollers for the 109 children Ukraine says Russia has killed so far. In a war that has also now claimed American Jimmy Hill from Minnesota. He was in Ukraine to be with his partner, who has a chronic medical condition. Jimmy was a friend to everyone, um, but he had a love for um, Irene that they were a bond. And if you can find that, you are so fortunate. The fates of many other civilians remain unclear in the devastated city of Mariupol. New video shows body after body laid out on the ground, some marked with makeshift crosses. It's the same city where this week Russia bombed a theater, even though there were signs outside in Russian that it was full of children. Ukrainian officials say 130 people have been rescued from a shelter beneath the theater, but that hundreds still remain trapped. Vicki, despite the optimism you hear on the streets, despite this palpable feeling of resistance, Ukrainian officials are deeply concerned, which is why every day President Zelensky asks a different Congress around the world for a no-fly zone, for more weapons, and multiple U.S. military officials that I'm speaking with are also deeply concerned, worried that Vladimir Putin in a corner might try to escalate his way out of this, potentially even using chemical or biological weapons. Richard Engel, thank you. Next tonight, as Russian forces continue their relentless assaults on Ukrainian cities, U.S. and Ukrainian officials sounding the alarm that local mayors may be the next targets of Putin's plan. Authorities saying multiple mayors have already been kidnapped, but Ukrainian resistance to the tactic has been strong. Gabe Gutierrez reports. Tonight, as Russian air attacks ravage more cities, Ukrainian and U.S. officials say Putin's playbook will likely increasingly include the systematic kidnapping of local leaders. This is a terror tactic. Grab local officials, depose local governments, put proxies in their place. Ukrainian authorities say at least four mayors have already been captured. One has been released, they say, as part of a prisoner swap. He's the mayor of Melitopol in southern Ukraine, who officials say was whisked out of City Hall wearing a bag over his head. His subsequent release and use of an expletive during a celebratory phone call made President Zelensky crack a smile. But fear is spreading. Today, this refugee told us the mayor of her city in southern Ukraine was in hiding. In another town about 75 miles from Kyiv, the mayor is now surrounded by armed guards. Many Ukrainian leaders defiant. Today we spoke with Lviv's mayor just hours after a Russian airstrike blew up a repair facility near the airport. The mayor has to be together with uh, his, his, his community, whatever happens. The Kremlin has not commented on the kidnappings. This is essentially what the Soviets did in Eastern Europe. Uh, during the Cold War um, in East Germany, um, in Czechoslovakia, um, in the other Warsaw Pact nations. And what I'm suggesting is it won't work in Ukraine. Gabe Gutierrez joins us now from Lviv, Ukraine. Gabe, talk to us about how this tactic, kidnapping these mayors, affects Putin's endgame for the invasion. Well, that certainly is a huge question at this point, Vicky. Putin, as our expert mentioned, has done this before, but most recently during the annexation of Crimea back in 2014 and then also the war with Georgia back in 2008. This time, however, the Ukrainian resistance has not made it easy. Vicky. Gabe Gutierrez, thank you. President Biden warned his Chinese counterpart today against aiding Russia militarily or financially. Important because the Chinese leader has close ties with Russia's President Putin. Kristen Welker is at the White House. 
In a critical test, President Biden held a nearly two-hour video call with Chinese President Xi Jinping, warning there would be consequences if China provides material support to Russia in its invasion of Ukraine, according to the White House. China has to make a decision for themselves about where they want to stand. The backdrop to the call tense after U.S. officials accused Russia of asking China for military and economic aid, something both countries deny. The Secretary of State added to the urgency Thursday with this. We're concerned that they're considering directly assisting Russia with military equipment to use in Ukraine. In an apparent attempt to downplay concerns, China, in its readout of the call, said President Xi told Mr. Biden the Ukraine crisis is something that we don't want to see, adding conflict and confrontation are not in anyone's interest. But China still has not condemned the invasion. We'll continue to watch until uh, we see what actions they take or don't take. Meanwhile, Russia called a U.N. Security Council meeting today to present claims of U.S. biological weapons labs in Ukraine. The U.S. ambassador to the U.N. called that a bizarre conspiracy theory, blasting her Russian counterpart's assertions. President Biden has a word for this kind of talk. Malarkey. But Vladimir Putin putting on a defiant show, holding a rally in Moscow where he quoted a Bible verse, saying, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. The White House dismissing the event as a misinformation and propaganda rally. Kristen Welker joins us now from the White House. Kristen, President Putin, he's not the only world leader to put the war in a religious context. Today we heard the Pope denounce this violence with strong language. What is he saying? Vicky, that's absolutely right. The Pope had very strong words. He denounced the violence in Ukraine, imploring, quote, in the name of God, I ask, stop this massacre. Now, interestingly, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki today was asked about this. She would not speak to the role the Pope could play in reaching an end to the conflict in Ukraine, saying the United States remains focused on engaging with our European allies and counterparts around the world. Vicky. Kristen Welker at the White House, thank you for insight and analysis on the war in Ukraine. We want to bring in former U.S. ambassador to Russia, Michael McFaul. He's also an NBC News national security and international affairs analyst. Thanks for being with us, Ambassador. Let's start with that call between President Biden and Xi. What's your read on where China stands right now on the question of helping Russia, whether it's with money or weapons? Well, they want to have their cake and eat it, too. Uh, they want to be by their ally. Xi Jinping has a close, used to have a close relationship with Putin. Uh, two autocratic leaders against the democratic world. They've met 40 times or so. Uh, a lot of trade and investment has been developing since the last time Putin invaded Ukraine back in 2014. But on the other hand, Xi Jinping wants to be a member of the, the international community of states. He doesn't want to see the destruction of international uh, institutions, the rule of law. He wants them to reform, whereas Vladimir Putin is trying to destroy the rules, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he's annexing territory. He's recognizing regions as being independent. And now he's uh, conducting this heinous, unprovoked war. And I think he has a real dilemma there. He wants to be supportive, but he doesn't want to go down the ship uh, uh, with Vladimir Putin. And I'm glad that President Biden is trying to force him to make a choice. Yeah, they had a long call today, two hours. That We just showed that video. Putin held a rally in a stadium today marking the anniversary of the annexation of Crimea. His rhetoric was frankly alarming. Let me, but look at those crowds. He was telling them Christian scripture to justify the invasion. This week, he said he wants to rid Russia of, quote, scum and traitors. That echoes some of the sentiments of Joseph Stalin. How concerned are you about Putin's escalation in messaging, not just to his people, but to the world at large? It's scary. Uh, he's walking around. The, it says, Zamir bis Nazisma, which means for peace without Nazis. Uh, that's the slogan that's behind him as he's walking around there. And let's be clear, there are no Nazis ruling Ukraine. President Zelensky is Jewish. Uh, he never had anything to do with any Nazi party. There are Nazi groups in Ukraine, like all over the world, but they don't rule uh, Ukraine, of course. Uh, and he's using that on purpose because that's the last great war that the Soviet Union fought was against real Nazis and Hitler's Germany, and they defeated the Nazis in 1945. It's called the Great Patriotic War, and that's what rallies people to say, well, if we did it then, we need to do it again now. But it is complete disinformation. It's shocking to me 
that so many people in the city of Moscow, mm -hmm. an educated, middle-class place, I used to live there, that's where I was ambassador, mm -hmm. would show up to that meeting. I can't believe that many people actually believe that propaganda. Uh, it's shocking to me if they do. Wow. Well, it is all that seems to be consistently, constantly played on state TV there. Ambassador, let me talk about your latest op-ed for The Washington Post. You made a case for why the West must boost military assistance to Ukraine. The U.S. just announced another round of weapons being sent there, $800 million more million. Now we got anti-aircraft systems, those killer drones. What more do you want to see? Well, first, I want to applaud the Biden administration for what they announced. Uh, the same day my piece came out, they did announce that new big P that, that package, and I, I think it's absolutely right. Along with sanctions against the Russian economy and strengthening NATO, those are the three core pillars of their strategy. I think they're all right. Uh, they're, they're all excellent. Let me be clear, not all right, <laughs> all are right. Um, uh, they're all excellent. As a professor, I give them A's uh, in all three categories. But my point was to remind them, this is just the early stages. This is just the first several weeks of this war. The Ukrainians are gonna need more weapons uh, to continue to fight this war. And in particular, they need surface to air missiles that can shoot down airplanes and can shoot down missiles out of the sky. Uh, there's an old Soviet system called S-300s that many of our allies uh, that used to be communist countries, now our allies, they have these systems those, in my mind, are the most important weapons uh, to get to, into Ukraine today, and I hope that the administration is doing that right now. And I think a lot of people are hoping it's enough. Ambassador McFall, thank you so much for your time and joining us on a Friday night. We appreciate you. Thank you. Tonight, a new front opening in the war in Ukraine, the fight to feed millions of displaced people. As Russian bombs disrupt supply lines in many major cities, more and more Ukrainians are growing hungry and desperate. NBC's Jacob Sobroff is in the, on the ground in Lviv with more. The situation here is desperate. Millions of Ukrainians without a place to live and increasingly without food to eat. Irina fled from Sumy. She says the only food there is bread, and even that's rare. The conditions especially dire in Mariupol. Aid workers have called it apocalyptic. Food is quickly running out and humanitarian convoys haven't been allowed in. It is cruel, this woman says. My child is hungry. I don't know what to give him to eat. Getting supplies to Ukraine's bombed out cities is growing more dangerous by the day. This massive warehouse in Kyiv used to hold 50,000 tons of food. It was hit not once, but twice. We find a different reality in Lviv, where food is still sold on the street for now. President Zelensky has encouraged you all, food producers, not to stop. Don't stop producing your food. Will you do that? No, I Maria tells me if we're alive, we're healthy. We'll continue doing this. If the food supply chain in Ukraine is further disrupted or markets like this continue to be attacked, things are going to look a lot different. Hundreds of thousands have sought refuge in this city. What's in here? Uh, these are hot meals. Being and World Central Kitchen is trying to feed as many of them as possible. We've got this incredible network of chefs and restaurants and delivery drivers. These friends fled Irpin. What about to have a meal like this, a hot meal? every day. Of course, we're so happy, she says. In our city, there's no gas, no water, nothing. Today, a cloud of smoke rose from behind another World Central Kitchen warehouse in Lviv, the aftermath of a Russian strike nearby. It didn't stop the work of feeding the hungry. Vicky, the World Food Program has been warning that Ukraine could soon fall into emergency levels of hunger and malnutrition, and that was before Russia had actually struck out attacking food storage facilities in places like Kyiv. Even the World Central Kitchen, that organization that I was on the ground with here in Lviv, looking to feed literally over a million meals since the start of the war, uh, saw from one of their warehouses here in this city the airstrike that struck at 6 o'clock this morning. That hasn't stopped them, though, from feeding the hungry. Vicky. Important look at the food supply chain. Thank you, Jacob. Now we want to update you on a story we've been following throughout the war in Ukraine. Foreign nationals there, many of them students, still struggling to get out of the war zone. It comes amid allegations that Ukrainian border guards are abusing people of color. Tonight, the shocking video appearing to show one official kicking black students. Zinkley Esamwa has more. Tonight, over 90 Africans and foreign nationals trapped in Ukraine, according to a student on the ground and rescue groups, over 20 days into Russia's invasion. 
Now students in Kherson are risking their lives, demanding an evacuation route. Tanks have been moving and the next thing we hear some as in rapid shooting close to us. So it's really, really terrible now. Trapped students like Jerry Kenny pleading with their governments for assistance. Please, these children need your help now. In war-torn Kherson, this video appears to show people in military uniform seen fighting for control of the region. When the war started, we ran individually, like running for your life. But after individual escape attempts failed, he says foreigners in Ukraine banded together, at least 14 nationalities represented in his group. According to a U.S. senior defense official, Kherson, located near the border of Crimea, was invaded and taken over by Russian forces. How dire are the circumstances right now? The last missile of the land close to our, where we stay, our basement was just 15 meters. Kenny says foreigners in Ukraine, including children and a pregnant woman, are falling sick from cold, lack of meds, and harsh conditions, seen in this video taken by Kenny, sent by a third party to conceal his location. Danielle Onyekwere and Fumi Adale Oladeo started the aid group Diaspora Relief to help stranded foreigners in Ukraine. They're trapped, they're kids, they're going through depression, and these are kids that are waking up to bomb. They're in touch with around 100 students spread out in the region who sent them these photos of grim conditions while in hiding. As for other refugees of color who have attempted to flee, this video shows alleged attacks against black students. This video at a Ukraine-Romanian border shows an official in uniform kicking black students. And here, black students are allegedly beaten up by uniformed officials screaming for help as officials fire gunshots into the air. Despite the challenges, some have managed to cross the borders, while those in Kherson continue to anxiously wait. Who needs to help you? Who are you calling for to do something? I'm calling on the United Nations, the Red Cross. And we need the war to come in now. Zinkle Esimwa joins us now from here at 30 Rock. It makes no sense, Zinkle, to see these beatings and uh, this force being used on these students who are simply trying to escape. They're saying they want the government and international bodies to do more. What are you hearing now in terms of the response? Yeah, Vicky, that's right. It makes no sense. And Jerry, the Nigerian we just heard from, specifically called out the UN and Red Cross. The Red Cross said this afternoon that generally they are delivering aid and evacuating people with disabilities and providing tools for first responders. The UN has not yet responded. And in response to the allegations in terms of what we saw at the border, Ukraine has said that all refugees should be treated equally. But, Vicky, I have to emphasize, even even as the group waits for aid, they're willing to put their lives on the line. I started reaching out to Jerry at 2 a.m. this morning. He's really become like a spokesperson for the group. And he says that he's been warned not to be so vocal because he might become a target. And he told me, and I want to use his words, he said, I'm not slowing down. I need the world to know that we're here. If I'm speaking up and they come for me, at least I know the world heard me. And so even as we're hearing success stories of students being evacuated, we also need to remember that many international visitors in Ukraine are still trapped. Vicky. We appreciate your reporting shining a light on what's going on. Zinkley, thank you. Thank you. Turning now to the pandemic, drug maker Moderna now requesting FDA emergency use authorization for a second booster shot. That's unlike Pfizer's submission for the adult 65 and older that happened earlier this week. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer joins us now. Hey, Miguel, why is Moderna asking for emergency use authorization of the second dose for everybody, while Pfizer is just asking for those seniors? Well, Vicki, it's a good question. It does send confusing signals. Scientists we've spoken to, including Dr. Fauci, say they still haven't seen and reviewed the data submitted by both Moderna and Pfizer to really be able to decipher the difference. Now, many experts believe older Americans would probably benefit from an added layer of protection. The bigger question here may be, is it really necessary for those adults who are under 65? Mm -hmm. Now, all of this comes as COVID cases, hospitalizations, and deaths have plummeted nationwide, but researchers are trying to get ahead of the next variant. BA2, an Omicron subvariant, is a major problem in this country, or it's becoming a bigger problem here. And officials say they want to get ahead of that, Vicki. Miguel, what do we know about a timeline for when we could see the FDA's decision? Well, the FDA hasn't made a clear timeline just yet, but we do expect this decision to likely take a few weeks. That'll be followed by the CDC's review of the FDA's decision. So we're looking at probably a few weeks, if not a month or so, Vicki. 
Miguel Almaguer, thank you. For more on Moderna's request for authorization and the fight against COVID, let's bring in NBC medical contributor and emergency medicine physician, Dr. Uche Blackstock. Happy Friday to you, Dr. Blackstock. Can you answer that question Miguel just raised? Moderna wants that emergency authorization for everybody. But at this point, what does the science say and the data say about another booster for healthy people who are under 65 years old? Thank you so much for having me. And what I will say is, you know, the, the data that we have so far does, necessarily, does not necessarily support boosting people under 65 years old. That, that's not to say the data is not there. We're waiting to see what data both Moderna and Pfizer um, come forward with. We do know that there is waning immunity after that third dose, that, that booster. And so that happens usually about four to five months. We need to see whether that has any consequences in terms of hospitalization and what that looks like as we stratify across age, uh, you know, chronic medical problems, uh, uh, immunocompromised status, and other sort of demographics. Dr. Blackstock, are these the same, boost, like these booster shots, would they be the same formula as the previous ones, or are they going to change the formulas to target the new variants that we keep seeing? It's like similar to what the scientists do every year with the flu shot. Right. So, so we actually don't have all that data yet, but what I will say is developed variant-specific vaccines take quite a while. And so this fourth booster is unlikely at this point to be a variant-specific vaccine, for example, for Omicron. But what, what, what may be happening is they may end up giving another dose similar to that dose for the, uh, of the third dose and give that again a, a fourth time. So we'll have to see, but right now it's very unlikely because those very specific vaccines require months and months of, of research and, mm -hmm. and as well as resources. And we know that congressional funding, that's where that was targeting as well. And speaking of funding, the White House is warning that the money is going to stop flowing, that COVID programs that reimburse doctors and medical providers for the cost of testing, treating and vaccinating the uninsured, that's all set to expire. Do you think it's a good idea to wind that down as we could be potentially facing another COVID <laughs> no. spike? No, no, this is really concerning. There's waning immunity to vaccines. We have the BA2 subvariant and we've had COVID protection lifted. And so, you know, and, and now this funding is ending and that's funding that will impact the availability of monoclonal antibodies of antivirals that will reimburse uh, physicians and healthcare providers for covering testing and treatments to uninsured people and even research for those variant specific vaccines. And so we need that funding um, even more now. This is such a critical time. So I'm hoping Congress will get it together and um, you know, vote to extend the funding that we need to really get out of this pandemic and to prepare us for the next one. We appreciate your insight and perspective as always, Dr. Uche Blackstock, thank you. Thank you. Still ahead tonight, an arrest in the deadly incident on a drawbridge. The bridge operator charged with manslaughter after she opened the bridge while a woman was on it. The text she allegedly sent right after. Plus, severe weather sweeping across the south. Millions now under alert for heavy rain, high winds, and possible tornadoes. The details next. We're back now with some dangerous weather wreaking havoc in the south. A possible tornado in southern Alabama shredding homes and destroying a trailer park, leaving at least three people injured. But the bad weather won't stop there. NBC News meteorologist Michelle Grossman is tracking it all for us tonight. Hey, Michelle. Hey there, Vicki. Great to see you. And yeah, it's a serious situation. We've been tracking it since overnight last night. And we're going to be tracking severe weather not only tonight, tomorrow, Sunday, we get a little break, and then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So let's take a look at what's happening right now. Because we're continuing to watch severe weather on radar, we're looking at lots of lightning, also some really heavy rain in spots. And you can see this is a huge storm stretching from the southeast all the way back to the upper Midwest. So as we zoom in a little closer here on radar, you can see a ton of lightning. We have a tornado tornado watch for the next couple of hours. We even have a tornado warning. We've seen these warnings come and go as we've been going through today into this evening. We're going to continue to watch this. On the back side of the storm, we have some snow even. So this is the setup here. We have that Gulf moisture streaming in. That's literally the fuel for the storms. We also have really gusty upper level winds. That's adding to the spin. It's adding to the lift. It's adding to the oomph of the storms. So that's what we're going to be watching over the next several days. This is what will happen as we head throughout the evening here. Continuing to watch those strong storms. 
storms. Then by Saturday, another wet day, another unsettled day for many of us, especially along the east coast, down to the southeast. So in the northeast, we're looking at some wintry weather in the state of Maine. Most of us will be unsettled. It's going to be a warm day. It's going to be a breezy day watching storms in the southeast. Severe threat tonight for 11 million. Look at what happens tomorrow, too. That stretches along the coast, so 12 million at risk tomorrow. And then look at this. We want to end here because we are looking at days and days of severe weather, not only today, not only tomorrow, but through Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Vicki? Wow, thank you, Michelle. We'll keep an eye on it this weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Wildfire emergency. Multiple wildfires merging outside of Dallas. Dozens of homes destroyed. The evacuations now underway. Back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the Florida drawbridge operator arrested after a woman died on that bridge. The 43-year-old is now charged with manslaughter. She opened the West Palm Beach Bridge as a 79-year-old woman was walking across, causing her to fall to her death. Court documents showing the operator texted someone after the incident, quote, I killed a lady on the bridge. Her bond now set at $20,000. Evacuations are underway as wildfires burn outside of Dallas, Texas. Officials say multiple bushfires merged to form a complex of wildfires that have now charred thousands of acres. Dozens of homes and other structures destroyed. Low humidity and gusty winds fueling those flames. Smoke even seen 300 miles away in Houston. So far, no injuries have been reported. A consumer alert tonight. Volkswagen is recalling more than 240,000 SUVs over braking concerns. The company says faulty wiring harnesses can make the vehicles break unexpectedly, sometimes while in traffic. Atlas SUVs and Atlas crossover sports from 2019 to 2023 could be impacted. Volkswagen says owners will be contacted starting in May. Moving back to Ukraine, where tonight a group of orphans is finding relative safety in Lviv. Losing their parents, traumatic enough, now they're enduring a war and an evacuation as children. An American organization is now helping them on their journey. NBC's Ali Aruzi has their story. These are some of Ukraine's orphans. They are the most vulnerable in society. Already without parents, some with physical disabilities, now the war has ripped them away from their secure environment. Some American groups are doing what they can. This country, the people are just suffering at no fault of their own. It's just, it's horrible. Aerial recovery is one of those groups. Mostly made up of U.S. military veterans working with the Ukrainian authorities to help these children with no parents escape the war-torn parts of Ukraine. Okay. Our objective has been to help and assist the local government with safely moving bunches of orphan children from danger areas into safe areas in the country where we can house them and feed them and keep them maintained in the system so that we don't lose track. At Lviv's train station, we met a group of 58 children along with their 12 Ukrainian caregivers that just got in from the east by rail, often stoic, but remarkably many of them smiling. What they have experienced so far? unimaginable. Some of the children, I mean, they've lost their family, so it's pretty traumatic. This war already devastating for children. 109 killed so far, 439 educational institutions damaged, 63 completely destroyed, according to Ukrainian officials. I was one of them at one point, so it only felt natural to be able to come. Vlad is also one of those volunteers. But he's not ex-U.S. military. He was once an orphan in Ukraine, adopted by a New York City detective when he was 15. He felt bound to come help, to give back. Luckily, I found this group um, to be able to do it, which is centered more towards where I come from, again, like, like orphans. The volunteers are eagle-eyed on the kids, constantly counting them, on the lookout for potential traffickers, people smugglers, blending in, looking for an opportunity to take advantage. The plan is to keep the kids in Ukraine, their home, and not to further displace them. When the fog of war settles, then they can figure out foster care or adoption. These are Ukraine's children. These children, these are, this is their heritage. This is their home. This family of orphans finally made it onto a bus with their belongings. They set off for the security of a shelter in Lviv, where they will find warmth, food, bedtime stories, and some much-needed love. That was powerful. Ali Abruzzi joins us now from Lviv. Ali, what can you tell us about these kids and what they were dealing with before they had to leave for Lviv? 
Hey, Vicky. So one of the directors of Ariel told us that these kids were living under appalling conditions. They spent most of the time in underground shelters out of fear with little resources in the freezing cold. But you could see the relief on their faces to escape that carnage, something no child should have to endure, especially an orphan. Can't forget those faces. Thank you, Ali Aruzi. Coming up, cargo ship disaster, the massive vessel sinking off the coast of Iran. The rush to save those on board and the search now for at least one crew member. Back now with Top Stories Global Watch. More than 9,000 people without power in Chile after a sandstorm. New video shows the massive dust cloud engulfing a community. Take a look at that. Heavy rain and hail also falling on the area. Roads were blocked and dozens of homes damaged. No injuries were reported. The search tonight for at least one person after a cargo ship sank in the Persian Gulf. New video showing the massive vessel from the United Arab Emirates on its side off the coast of Iran. First responders rescuing 29, but one person is unaccounted for. Officials say bad weather caused the ship to capsize, with winds over 40 miles an hour reported in the area. And the Great Barrier Reef once again suffering coral bleaching. It is the largest coral reef in the world, and parts of it are now turning white due to high temperatures in the ocean. It comes two years after rising temps caused bleaching across about two-thirds of the reef. The U.N. is set to inspect the coral reef next week. Well, if it's Friday night, you know it's Dateline. Tonight, the story of Pamela Butler, a manager at the Environmental Protection Agency who vanished without a trace in 2009. On a special two-hour edition of Dateline, correspondent Dennis Murphy unwinds the mystery of her disappearance, the connection to another missing woman, and a lonely stretch of road. These grainy nighttime images are some of the last known moments in the life of a successful woman a person who simply vanished without a trace from her home. What happened inside that house? You might know some of her story, but solving what happened to her opened up an entirely new saga you don't know about another missing woman. It's a big puzzle. It took decades to unsnarl the stories of the two women who didn't know one another, but who both ended up years apart in the same place. It's idiosyncratic. That's a signature. Without a few individuals stricken with a bad case of justice fever, we might never know their stories at all. They found out that I wasn't going to give up. Not the twists. Two women, two children, neither knows about the other. Yes. The setbacks. The cause of death was undetermined. The stark fear of it all. He says, oh my God, he's going to kill her and he's going to kill me. The fates of Pam and Marta, united in horror on one of the busiest stretches of interstate in the country. When all that stuff started coming out, I was like, oh, my God, this guy's a monster. And Dateline's Dennis Murphy joins us now. Dennis, this is a story that unfolded over decades. It now links two women who didn't know each other in life, but they're now forever connected in death. One disappeared in 1989, the other in 2009. Tell us how long it took investigators to connect the dots between their deaths and how did they do it? Vicki, it took them 20 years to put this together. You had detectives, generations of detectives mm -hmm. on both sides of the river, Metropolitan Police in Washington, D.C., got the one investigation as far as they could, and then it went across the river to, across the Potomac to Arlington, and another set of detectives worked on the second woman. You have one guy, one violent man with two women missing in his life. One's in Washington, D.C., and the other is in Arlington in the suburbs. And it took a long time to put it together. And I think those detectives struck up a personal relationship with the, with the, with the victims, with the family members here. And that drove them on, because when, when this case was hitting a brick wall, and it was, mm. the victim from D.C., Pam Butler, her brother Derek is one of the squeakiest wheels I've ever met. And I say that in the best of all possible ways. He demanded results, and he mm. kept on coming and kept on coming. And because he did, and because he won the confidence of the investigators, he ended up being a key part of solving two different murders here. But it we'll took a long time to connect those dots. We'll look forward to seeing that. Tell me about this, Dennis. You do so many of these stories. You meet so many families and investigators. They're so dogged about their mission. What is it that's the common link for the cases that are solved? Is it that, you know, squeaky wheel? It's that persistence? I, I think it is the squeaky wheel. And I don't mean that in a facetious kind of way, Vicky, but 
we had one investigator who was on this thing in the early days, Mitch Cradle. And Mitch said, you know, I've got this case on my desk of missing Pam Butler, trying to figure it out, but I've got four other cases that have hit my desk overnight. I've got I'm more, a lot more in the morning. I just don't have the time available to do it. So I think if there's a dedicated officer working with the family, going back and resetting the clock to the first hours of the investigation, people get results. But you have, if you're a family member or a loved one, you have to keep coming and saying, what do you have for me today? Even though they're telling you to be quiet and sit down, we don't want to hear it from you, we'll get back to you. You can't do that. You've got to stay on them. And that's what happened. That's why we have results here in the Pam Butler uh, and uh, Marta Rodriguez case. Never give up. Thank you, Dennis Murphy. And you can catch more Dateline tonight at 9 p.m. on NBC. For Tom Yamas, I'm Vicki Wynn in New York. Stay right there. More news now on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.